Welcome back to ECE 320A. As I can tell by the stack of papers on the desk, homework number whatever, four is due today. And I think the next time we meet, homework five will be due. So I need to make that available. That'll only be 100 problems that you can need to do between now and Tuesday. It should be finishing up chapter 12 material. If you're focusing in on exam number two, which I have placed material finally on the D2L for exam number two, focus on chapter 12 material. Some of those old exams have power problems. Some of them have chapter 13 material in S domain analysis. You don't have to worry about that so much as all of the stuff in chapter 12. That's what we'll focus on for this semester in for exam number two. And exam two is next week at this time. That means I have to write one, doesn't it? Okay. So, and you might want to help. Oh, I need to figure out when a review session will be. Does Tuesday night work? Is that better than Wednesday night? Okay, so I'll probably do a Tuesday night. What time? Eight o'clock? Seven? Really? Seven that late? What time did we do it last time? Six, I think, because I had something before, but I could do it earlier than that. Would five be okay on Tuesday for a review? What? 5.30? Okay, we can do an average. We'll do 5.30 on Tuesday. That'll be the plan, but come to class on Tuesday. I'll try to post that on D2L, but I think what you've just told me was on the 22nd. Oh, and I need to make sure that we have the room, but I'll just see. Whoops, that's not where we want it, is it? Where did we have it? 107, I think. <clears throat> Let me verify those. Obviously, I haven't done my homework on that. Today, what I want to do is finish up case number two, one of our examples that we had started, which is repeated roots and the generic case or the general case where you have more than maybe two, maybe you have three or four repeated roots. I also want to talk a little bit about working with complex roots and only using real numbers. So you don't have complex numbers floating around. You can do that. You can just keep those quadratic factors without factoring them into the complex pairs. And really that means that you're saying that these two forms can be equivalent by the appropriate choice of A and B or by the appropriate choice of A bar and theta, and we'll talk about that today. We'll show why these two are equivalent. It's really a trig identity, but you need to be comfortable with going back and forth. When somebody says, oh, I've excited this system with a damped exponent, a sinusoidally damped exponential, now you know that you really have a sine and a cosine piece to that, but if you want, you can put them together and just keep track of a cosine with a phase shift with an angle. And those are the same idea, or those are equivalent statements or equations. We will then formalize what we've been throwing around up to this point, poles and zeros of transfer functions. And I don't know if we'll get into the initial value theorem, but we'll try to get to the final value theorem. And this is a way, if somebody says, where's your signal going? If you know the final value theorem, you actually don't have to inverse Laplace transform. You can simply look at some limiting con conditions and find that final value rather quickly once you have it in the S domain, and that's a good thing. Similarly, for the initial value theorem, you can basically say, where did we start? Where did we start at t equals 0 plus? Where were we coming from? And the initial value theorem gives us a way of finding that. Here is where I want to continue from, from last time, the partial fraction expansion. Case one is what case? 
distinct roots. All of our poles are distinct. Now they could be complex conjugate pairs, but one is upstairs and one's downstairs. They do represent two distinct pole locations. When we have a repeated root, here I'm saying that we have in Nebraska poles at minus p sub zero. In order to do this partial fraction expansion, we want to make sure that the numerator polynomial degree is strictly less than the denominator. And in this example, it would need to be less than little n, the degree of the numerator. Then you know how to put this into a partial fraction expansion. The hard part is finding these coefficients, the a sub 1s, the a sub 2s. The a sub 1 is not difficult. That's just like you've done case one before. It's the other coefficients, a sub two up to a sub n, that's a little bit more challenging. And if you want, you can do it with the derivative approach. And this is now just the formula that we had placed, I believe, on the board at the end of last lecture or near the end. Meaning if we want a sub two, as a coefficient, we then have 1 over 2 minus 1 factorial, but that's 1 factorial. That basically goes away, and we have the 2 minus 1 derivative of that expression. Well, 2 minus 1 is 1. We have the first derivative of that left-hand side multiplied or with that factor s plus p sub 0 to the n canceled in the original transform capital F of x. This we had last time. Let's look at the example that was your homework, which I'm sure you've already done. What's the partial fraction expansion of this look like? And let's start with the S plus 2 factor. In order to be consistent with our formula that we just presented, we would say A1 is associated with the highest power of our denominator factor. Then we just keep going with A subs, A sub 2, until we have reduced the power to 1. Now we're finished with that repeated factor. There were three roots at minus p sub 0. We now have three factors in our partial fraction expansion associated with those three roots. We had three poles at minus p sub 0. Oh, I guess minus 2 in this case. I'm actually doing a problem, aren't I? I need to wake up <coughs> again. And a sub 4 can be over the other one, the remaining distinct root. And now I've simply done the, the algebra. a sub 4 is a case 1. That's s plus 1 times the transform that we started with. So that just cancels the s plus 1 factor in the denominator, and we simply replace all of our s's with the value of s that causes the factor s plus 1 to vanish. And if we do that, we end up with a sub 4 being minus 2. And now we know immediately what that would look like in the time domain, or that's what I want you to be doing by next week, to quickly be able to inverse Laplace transform that that term. A1, we said we can use case number one when we have to find the partial fraction coefficient for the highest power of that repeated root. And in this case, that's the s plus 2 quantity cubed partial fraction expansion coefficient. If we scale our original transform, capital V of S, by this S plus 2 cubed factor, 
that cancels that factor in the denominator and the only thing left in the denominator is this s plus one factor. The numerator is left unchanged and we simply replace s with the value of s that causes that factor to vanish, which in this case is minus two. Are there questions on this? This is case one applied to this the first stages of this process when we have repeated roots. Everybody's okay with that. That's what you've been doing this anyway on your homework, I'm assuming, if you if your paper is in that stack. Okay. If it's not, maybe you have some work this afternoon. A sub two. Now let's just brute force apply that expression or that formula. And I'm replacing little l or lowercase l in that formula with where it belongs so that now I really am taking the first derivative of that expression when it's been scaled by s plus 2 cubed. So I now take the first derivative of that and you can use your quotient rule if you have a song that you remember that by. I don't know little history. When I was maybe about your age, I can't hardly remember that far back, but sometime in high school in trigonometry, they they were singing songs to remember all these trig identities. And it's like, no, I don't want to sing. So things with sign and S I G N and S I N E, but you know, you just say sign. And so you're supposed to know, I guess, by inflection which sign you're referring to. Sine, 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 cosine, sine. I don't know, something like that. That was some trig identity that we just sang. Good thing we're not doing that. We're only telling MIT jokes in this class. And we're going to use that again today. But if we differentiate that ratio of polynomials, and I've done it the old-fashioned way, I've just considered it to be a product of two terms, where one of those terms is in the denominator, and that's why I get the minus, and then I differentiate s plus 1, and I lower it to a minus 2, and that plops it downstairs with a squared, and then I differentiate s plus 1 with respect to s, and that's simply 1. I evaluate that at minus 2, and in the black parentheses, I've simply obtained a common denominator, and this is what you would obtain maybe more directly if you use the quotient rule for differentiating that. The reason I kept that black expression is because I'm going to need to differentiate another time to get the a sub 3 coefficient. I might as well say, oh, I've already found the first derivative. Why do it again? I'll differentiate that one time to get the second derivative meaning you might as well keep track of this if you're doing it with paper and pencil. You're doing it the old school way. a sub 3 then, plugging in 3 where it belongs. Now I have the second derivative of the original expression, but like I just was trying to explain, that's just one fewer derivatives than that term in black. I now just need to differentiate that black term one time because that's already my first derivative. Again, using the old school approach to differentiating that, I end up with a sub 3 when it's evaluated, that expression when it's evaluated at s equal to minus 2 being 2. I now have all of my coefficients using the derivative method, but I could have found a sub 2 and a sub 3 other ways. I could have obtained a common denominator and now found maybe two equations in two unknowns and solved for a sub 2 and a sub 3. Maybe I could have found one of those or one equation by using a limiting argument and then finding a convenient value for s and now I have two equations to find a sub 2 and a sub 3. So you can combine these if you want these techniques. But once you have those partial fraction expansion coefficients, 
you can now write immediately. And even if you didn't find this, and some of the exam questions will potentially be, just give me the structure of your answer. When I say that, I want you to give me all of these t's or t squareds, these decaying, the exponentials, and the frequencies and the sines and cosines, but you don't need to formally find those coefficients, a1, a2, a3, and a4. I'm assuming that if you have time, you could find those. What I'm looking for mostly is to make sure that you're, you have the connection between how do I go from the frequency domain to the time domain with an inverse transform. So if I just ask for the structure of little v of t, this is how you could write it. And that could be written down directly once you have this partial fraction expansion formula. That's what I'm hoping. So if I, if I gave you this capital V of S and I said find the structure of little v of t, then you would do this step, find the partial fraction expansion without finding the coefficients, and then I would expect you to immediately jump down to that answer. Is that clear? Not having to find or evaluate the partial fraction expansion coefficients. That's what I'm meaning when I say give me the structure of the time domain expression. Do you want the short version of what we just did? If you have a calculator that performs this, you could just type in expand in this way and it will immediately find those partial fraction expansion coefficients. <clears throat> yes? The method being your calculator. So I'm maybe hopeful you didn't use it too much on the homework, but on the exam you can use it. But I think if you don't have a calculator, I would immediately write down the structure and say I'm going to return and find those coefficients if I have to find them by hand. I don't want you to be overly penalized if you don't have a calculator that does this. But if you have a calculator, you might as well use it to your benefit to do these algebraic steps. And hopefully that works for your calculator. It seemed to work for mine, but if it doesn't work for yours, see me after class. I don't want to spend any more time <laughs> on that here, but I hope that that will allow you to get those partial fraction coefficients. But on the exam, what I would suggest that you do is you would say via the calculator. So if you show me your partial fraction expansion, with the unknown coefficients, then you could say using calculator and write down the numerical result. Is that clear? And obviously once you have those coefficients identified, what you have to remember though is that when you get higher than a square, factor, then you have to start dealing with these divisions by the factorial. And that factorial is one less than the power of the factor that you're dealing with. So if we had a s plus p sub 0 to the fourth, then we would have a t cubed and we would be dividing by 3 factorial. But that's in that formula that I think I gave you last time for this structure. Questions on that? And there are videos to help you maybe do that with your calculator, with distinct roots or with real roots and with complex roots. Let's now see what we could do if we have, we know now I'm hoping now that everyone in this class can immediately tell me where the poles are in that transfer function when it's written in this factored form. That should just be, you're just writing the equation down or the answer down. That's what I'm hoping. Where are the poles of capital F of S? 
Everybody get that? No noise at all in the classroom. Minus 2 plus and minus J3, right? Now, if I give you a quadratic, that quadratic may have real roots, so make sure you at least try to factor it. I may give you a quadratic and say, okay, they need to realize that this either has two real roots or it has complex conjugate roots. And if it has complex conjugate roots, then maybe you want to rewrite it in that form. What I'm saying is I might give you capital F of S that looks like S squared plus 4S plus 13. And that's underneath 5S plus 2. And I haven't given you the S plus 2 squared plus 3 squared. But if you now use the quadratic formula and say, oh, that's complex roots, you could rewrite it as the green formula in the denominator. That's fine. Oh, I quit. All right, I guess we're done. What's, what is f of t? If you now have this formula, what would you expect to be seeing in the time domain? What is f of t or what is the structure of f of t? If it's written already in that <coughs> factored form of the quantity s plus 2 quantity squared plus 3 quantity squared, can you immediately write down the answer for just the structure? f of t equals what? I'm hoping that you know that the poles are at minus 2 plus and minus j3 from that. So now this real part, that gives you the damping, doesn't it? That gives you the decay. That's the e to the minus 2t. And the imaginary part or imaginary component gives you the damped frequency. And if you don't do any other work to this, you may not know whether you have a cosine piece or a sine piece, so in general, you have both. Once you hit the system with that decaying exponential, then it's actually shaking with both a cosine and a sine, and you know that. Meaning, the structure of f of t would be, let's say, a, e to the minus 2t, cosine of 3t, plus b, e to the minus 2t, sine of 3t. Or, and we'll show this later, you could say, you know what? I want k e to the minus 2t cosine of 3t plus some angle theta. That's equivalent. Those two expressions are equivalent. They have two unknowns, either a capital A and a capital B, or a magnitude and a phase. And we want to, by the end of this lecture, well, by the middle of this lecture, you better be comfortable with the equality of both of those. That's the plan. So now if we look at the top one, the A, the capital A and the capital B, how do we find those? Capital F of S was 5S plus 2 over let's say s plus 2 squared plus 3 squared. Now you plug that into your calculator with the expand 
function. Voila, it gives you that same thing back. So now what do you do? Throw the calculator up against the wall and ask your parents for another one? No. You show them your grit and determination and you say, I know that I just said it has a cosine piece and a sine piece. And you can go to your table and find the structure of that cosine piece and sine piece and say, well, I have some amount of the co decaying exponentially or exponentially damped cosine so now I have a of that and my exponentially damped cosine has an s plus 2 in the numerator the denominator is the same and I also have a piece associated with the exponentially damped sine and what is B scaling? S, S minus 2, 25, 9, 10, 8, 7, 6. No, you shouldn't be guessing, right? What's B scaling? If you went and looked at the table, of the transform pairs and you said oh I need the exponentially damped sine pair what's its transform look like that's omega isn't it in the numerator omega over s plus sigma squared plus omega squared in this case our omega is 3 and so now we have b times 3 the denominator in that expression is the same. The only way to make those equal then is to make the numerator equivalent. If we look at the numerator, we were again trying to find a and b. How much of the cosine and how much of the sine do we have? If we look at the numerator, we have 5s plus 2, and that must equal a times s plus 2, which is as plus 2a, plus 3 times b. Or equating coefficients for the, con or for the linear term in s, on the left we have 5, and on the right we have a. So even though this is two equations in two unknowns, they're somewhat decoupled. We've already found the a. But in general, you might end up with two equations and two unknowns that you have to solve for A and B. In this case, we had a sort of a decoupling or a sequential version of that problem. We now have 2 on the left for the constant, and on the right we have 2A plus 3B. But 2A was simply 10. And so we now know that minus 8 is equal to 3b, or b is now minus 8 over 3. And now we know exactly what the time domain expression for f of t is, little f of t. Little f of t is now a, which we found to be 5, e to the minus 2t, cosine of 3t, there's our damped frequency, minus... 8 thirds e to the minus 2t, the same amount of exponential decay, sine, and the sine is shaking at the same frequency as the cosine. Now, did everybody do their homework that way? Did they stick with real coefficients? Depending on your calculator type or, or your personality, you may like to work with complex numbers, you may not. There we didn't. But some of you might be saying, but my answer was a cosine.
What's going on? Well, you probably solved it using complex numbers. So if we solve that same problem, then you would have said, oh, here's my f of s, and I thought Tharp told me to solve it this way, 5s plus 2 over s plus 2 squared plus 3 squared. I thought I was supposed to say that that was k1 over an s plus 2 minus j3. Where's that pole? What quadrant in the complex s plane? Second. It needs to be in the second. That's where you want to locate your unconjugated factor. And then the other one, whoa. Excuse me. Is S plus 2 plus J3, and that's the twin or the cousin downstairs. And you would have then, either in your calculator or by hand, you could now say, oh, this is just 5s plus 2 over. I've canceled the factor underneath or associated with the k1 term, so I must have left the factor associated with the pole in the third quadrant, and I evaluate that at the location of the pole that I canceled, which is the one in the second quadrant, minus 2 plus J3. Is that clear? You can now substitute that value of S in, and you end up with 5 halves plus J 4 thirds, a complex number. <clears throat> or you could, that's the rectangular form of K1, you could rewrite that as some magnitude at an angle of opposite over adjacent, and that should give you 8 fifteenths when you clear the fractions, or if you clean this up, it's now 2.833 at an angle of 28.07 degrees. This is now 4 times 2 or 8, and downstairs 3 times 5 or 15. <clears throat> Questions on that? So if that was inverse tangent of 15 over 15, you would have known that angle should have been you went up as far as you went over, up and over the same distance. What's your angle? 45. So you're saying, oh, I didn't go up as high as I went over. I should be less than 45 degrees, just as a check. You need ways of quickly checking your work so that you don't misplace your decimal place like I did with yes, Tuesday. What's today? Thursday? Wow, okay. The weekend's not too far away. Your exam's a week away, right? <clears throat> okay. have to keep reminding you when the exam is because that's really the cue to me that I have to create an exam. What's f of t then? It's 2 times the magnitude of k1, and we just computed that e to the minus, and now we have to go back and we say, oh, the real part of that was at minus 2. There's our decay. We have our cosine. What's the frequency? How fast is it moving or oscillating? That's the imaginary component. That was 3. And then our angle was at 28.07. And again, this is t greater than or equal to 0. And that red equation, if we multiplied this out, we would have maybe a 5.67. That should be the same as that f of t. Right? 
We just worked it two different ways, but they better be giving us the same answer. And that's what we want to convince ourselves of now. So the f of t's Maybe I shouldn't say they're the same. They're equivalent. Just a different way of writing. Now we put on our y hat. Where did that where are we getting that? Well, we could in general say that we have f of t is equal to r e to the minus alpha t cosine omega t plus some angle theta. That was our last result that we had, just replacing the magnitude with a general r and the angle with a general theta. But we could rewrite that using our sum of angle formula for the cosine, meaning we could now have r e to the minus alpha t, but we could rewrite that cosine as cosine omega t cosine of theta minus sine omega t sine of theta. That's just the trig identity for the cosine of a plus b. Which now if we push that r through the bracket, we now have r cosine of theta cosine omega t minus r sine of theta, sine omega t. Or, this is now e to the minus alpha t, whoops, uh, I wanted to use an alpha and a beta. Can I change my notation? Can I make this a bar? that okay? Now I'm going to call this piece alpha. That's just a number, isn't it? R was a magnitude. Theta is a fixed angle. R times the cosine of a fixed angle is just going to be a number, and I'm calling that number alpha. Plus beta sine omega t, where this is now my beta. Any questions on that? Uh, yeah, okay, I used, you know what I should have done. Make that another Greek symbol. That's a lowercase sigma. Maybe that will help minimize some of the confusion. Is that okay? So now I have a decay of e to the minus sigma t, and I have alpha cosine omega t plus beta sine omega t. And now you're doing your homework with somebody else, and they found this cosine expression, and you found an alpha and a beta in your expression. You want to check your work. You want to make sure that it's consistent. Well, what we've done then is we've simply said alpha is equal to r cosine of theta, and this beta is minus r sine of theta. And now you just have to remember our joke. Which one? There's been so many. <laughs> no. This is our East Coast joke, right? The MIT joke. Already forgotten it? Oh man. What's sine squared and cosine squared? They're one, aren't they? Well, we can get a cosine squared and a sine squared if we squared both sides of both of these equations. Meaning, if I now look at alpha squared plus beta squared, I now have r squared cosine squared of theta. And if I square minus r, I get plus r squared sine squared of theta. 
our joke allows us to conclude that that's just r squared. We can factor out the r squared and sine squared and cosine squared are one. So that now says that if you want the magnitude in your cosine expression, you simply take the magnitude of the cosine piece and square that and add that to the magnitude of the sine piece, square that and take the square root, and now you have the magnitude of just the single cosine expression. Now we need the angle theta. But if we simply take the ratio of those two terms, we will end up with a tangent of theta, and we can do the inverse tangent. Meaning if I now look at beta divided by alpha using the beta and alpha that I had defined, I now see that that's minus sine theta over cosine theta, or that's just minus the tangent of theta. Or I might want to put that minus sign next to the beta instead of the on the other side so that I now say could say that theta is now the angle that's the inverse tangent of minus beta over alpha. And now you have a way of computing or converting one to the other, one structure versus the other. And in our example, we had alpha equal to 5, and beta was equal to minus 8 thirds. So that R now becomes the number that we want, which was 5.67. That's consistent with our single cosine expression. Theta now is the invert man. Is the inverse tangent of minus 8 over 15, which is a, we had to do a negative beta, so we convert that negative to a positive, and that gives us this angle that we needed of 28.07. Questions on that? That's... Yes, so now the question was, in order to generate this expression for little f of t, which complex number in the partial fraction expansion do we focus on? And that's why I've been trying to make it clear that that's the one that you pick. You pick that coefficient, k sub 1, you take its magnitude and angle, because if you took the other one, the angle would be the opposite in sign. And the way these formulas have been formulated, you need k1 to be consistent or associated with the factor or the root that's in the second quadrant. That's why it's important to pick that coefficient. Questions on any, did that answer your question? Now, if you... wanted to do this graphically. Then you could just write this particular picture on your paper. Here's the positive cosine axis, and here is the positive sine axis, meaning when I had the alpha cosine plus beta sine, I put the alpha on the right hand side and I put the beta positive down. What were my alphas and betas in my formula before? 
didn't I have a alpha of 5? So that would be this point. And what was my beta? Minus 8 thirds. So now I go in the negative direction. It's almost 3, isn't it? 9 thirds. So I go up to here, and this is now my minus 8 thirds. That's the direction that I go. Now what I do is I simply combine those using Pythagorean theorem or whatever you want to use so that this particular length of the hypotenuse is the magnitude of my cosine. And this is the angle associated with my cosine factor. So if you're given an alpha, so this is the alpha and the beta. If you're given the alpha and the beta, make sure you observe the sign of the beta. If it's positive, then you're going to be plotting that down, and that will give you a negative theta value in your cosine expression. So sometimes this is a quick way to go through all those formulas, and you can graphically see where you're at. Questions on that? Is it clear what I'm trying to say with that? Are you comfortable now with somebody if they said, oh, I'm shaking your system with an e to the minus 2t cosine of 3t, what do you know is going to happen in your circuit? You're going to see both the cosine and the sine, aren't you? Or you're going to see that cosine shifted in time so it has a magnitude and an angle. Those are equivalent. I want you to be comfortable with the equivalence of those two expressions. Is that good? That's enough for inverse Laplace transform. Let's now play with these concepts that we've created, which are these transfer functions or transforms. And once we start creating these transfer functions, now we can start referring to poles and zeros. Let's say that I now am given a transfer function, capital X of S, of S squared plus 4S plus 3. And downstairs I have S cubed plus 9S squared plus 33S plus... 65. And this is by inspection. You can see that that has a root of 5. You should know this by the exam. Maybe we won't have calculators. So I'll give you a fifth order polynomial and have you factor it. That seems to be my favorite quadratic, doesn't it? S plus 2 quantity squared plus 3 squared. So if you had to factor something, you might say, oh, let's just use that. That's probably what it is. <clears throat> you might be given a quadratic and some other terms, you might be given two quadratics to give you a fourth order, you would need to factor the quadratic. I'm assuming you can use the quadratic formula to see if they're complex or if they're real factors. Questions on that? And this then, for notation in a minute, I'm going to call the numerator capital N of S and the denominator polynomial capital D of S for obvious reasons, hopefully, numerator and denominator. Now let's define some terms officially. I think we've been talking about these before because I think we've been playing with X's and O's already since we like to play with X's and O's. But values of S and 
that actually cause this transfer function, capital X of S, to vanish or to equal zero, those values of S are, I hope, obviously called zeros. And if we want to get a little bit more specific, we could say that values of S that actually cause the numerator polynomial, capital N of S, which is the numerator of X of S, to equal zero, those we will call finite zeros. Typically, we won't even distinguish between zeros and finite zeros. Usually, we're just talking about finite zeros. But if somebody starts saying, oh, you have a zero at infinity, or you have how many zeros at infinity, or there's a zero at infinity, at least you know what they're talking about. And that happens when you have a mismatch in order between the numerator and denominator. You could have zeros at infinity. In our example, now this is testing your memory, what were our zeros in capital X of S? They're the values of S that cause the numerator to vanish. So we're at minus 1 and minus 3, aren't we? We then have, if we were wanting to sketch this in the complex S plane, zeros are indicated by open circles. This is our complex S plane. This is the real axis and the vertical is the imaginary axis. Now the poles are those values of S that cause capital X of S to become infinite or blow up. And those values of S are called poles. And likewise, we can talk about the finite poles. The values of S that cause the denominator of capital X of S, which we went ahead and explicitly defined to be capital D of S, those values of S that cause D of S to vanish to equal zero, those are our finite poles. And in our example, where are our poles? How many poles do we have? You look at the power of your denominator, it's S cubed, you know you have three poles. So if you didn't do anything on the exam, you would say, I know there's three poles. You could have three real poles. You could have one real and two complex conjugate. In this case, we have a pole, a real pole at minus 5, and a pair of conjugate poles at minus 2 plus and minus j3. And if we were to then sketch those, Our poles would be the x's at minus 2 plus j3 and minus 2 minus j3 and a pole at minus 5. 
And if I said sketch the pole zero pattern of this transfer function, then I'm just asking you to sketch some X's and O's, right, in the complex plane, indicating where those zeros are and the poles are. And we will, at some point, put a circus tent on this. All right, so keep in mind what we have. We have poles. So now think of infinitely tall poles. Where you have an X, you now have an infinitely tall pole. And where you have a zero, you have a thumbtack. Put a rubber sheet over that S plane, and we're going to be interested in the height of that big top tent as we walk along the imaginary axis. That's going to be our frequency response, the magnitude of our frequency response. So now you can tell your parents you went to the circus in 320A. We learned about poles and zeros and rubber sheets. So if you stick a rubber sheet on that picture, you can start to see this big top circus tent where the poles are infinitely tall and your zeros are thumbtacks holding that rubber sheet down. And then you're walking underneath the imaginary axis, or you're walking up the imaginary axis. At this point, right there, wherever that was, I'm not doing it again. At the origin, omega is what? What's the frequency at the origin? It's DC, isn't it? It's zero. And now as you march up that axis, you're taking on higher and higher frequencies. J1, omega is 1, it's 1 radian per second. So if you excited your system with a frequency of 4 radians per second, you're sitting there right above J3 at J4, shaking at 4 radians per second. And you're looking up to see the cards on the ceiling. It's an eight of diamonds and a queen of hearts. Right? <laughs> I don't know. I thought I had my playing cards correct. I put those up last night. I jumped up and touched them. <laughs> yeah, right. Climbed a ladder. Had to get a ladder diagram. All right, are we okay with this concept? Poles and zeros, rubber sheets. Let's now get into, and you know what's going to happen if we, if we had this pole zero configuration, and I said, what's the structure? So I could maybe draw you this pole zero diagram, and I might say, that represents the transfer function of the capacitor voltage. That's capital V of S, pole, and zeros. What's little v of T? What's the structure of little v of T? What's the time domain voltage going to look like? What terms will it possess? Can you tell me from that picture, from the pole zero pattern? What do poles give us? Those give us the exponential decays if it's only real, right? And if they're complex conjugate, the real part gives us the decay, and the imaginary part gives us the frequency. You don't have to worry about the zeros. They just sort of allocate where this energy is flowing. But the poles give us the structure of how our system is shaking. If our system is shaking according to this pole zero diagram, what's it shaking like? Is this making any sense? So if we had, if this pole zero diagram is associated with a capital V of S, now I'm asking, 
What's the structure of the time domain voltage? So we have some piece, I don't know, let's say A1, E to the minus 5T, right? Because we had a pole at minus 5, and that gives rise to, when we inverse Laplace transform, that gives us this E to the minus 5T. Then what else do we have? And now, after today's lecture, you should know you could write this two different ways, right? You could write it as a single cosine, or you could write it as a cosine and a sine combined. But they both have what for the decay? So why don't I write it as a cosine, because I'm getting tired. K, E to the what is it? All of that from that pole zero diagram, pole zero pattern. So that's a pretty powerful picture. And you would then have to find your A1 and your K. But now if I said which of these terms is going to last the longest, if you play this tape, if you watch V of T, V of T is combining these point for point in time. You should be able to sketch this, right? If you were drawing this, you could draw a1 e to the minus 5t, and you could draw k e to the minus 2t cosine of 3t. You know how far apart the humps are on your cosine. They're influenced by the frequency of 3. Maybe it's shifted a little bit with the phase, but you know the decay. Which of these decays fastest? The first one, e to the minus 5t. In one second, it's already down to e to the minus 5, isn't it? And the other term is decayed to e to the minus 2. And e to the minus 2 is not quite as tiny as e to the minus 5. So e to the minus 2t term is going to be the slower or the dominating behavior. So this is going to look more like an exponentially damped cosine. That e to the minus 5t happens pretty quick relative to the other term. Is that making sense? Now, if I said, what's the final value of this? Little v of t, what's the final value of little v of t? You would take the t limit as t marches off to infinity. And what happens? Now you have e to the minus infinity, e to the minus infinity. That's squishing everything. It's zero, isn't it? But now what I'm saying is we could start with this transfer function, not have to do any inverse transforming, and find the final value in the time domain from just this capital X of X. That's what we want to be able to do. So let's now look at these limiting behaviors. Sometimes we're only interested in the initial value or the final value. of the time function, which means that we may want to invoke the initial value theorem or what's called the final value theorem. Let me state the final value theorem. And then we'll use it. Maybe we'll prove it some other day because we're running short on time. Okay, So here it is. First, we have two conditions that need to be true. If x of t and its derivative, x prime of t, can be, 
can be Laplace transformed or are Laplace transformable. Don't show that to your English teacher. Or if these signals are well behaved, physical systems or signals are well behaved. If we're dealing with a physical signal, it's well behaved. So most of the signals we deal with in this class satisfy condition one. If one, okay, we're just going to probably assume that's true. Then the second condition is we look at the transfer function capital X of S multiplied by S. We look at the result of that and we say, are there any poles of this expression on the imaginary axis? And if they are, then we can apply the final value here. So S X of S has no poles on the J omega axis. Or in the right half plane. Uh, in the right half S plane. If they're in the right half plane, then we have exponential increase and we don't have a final value, do we? We have something burning. We have something unstable. It's burning up. If it was a circuit, your circuit would probably be toast. It would burn up or maybe start a fire. Okay, so you don't want poles in the right half plane. If these two conditions are true, then the limit as t marches off to infinity of x of t can be found by looking at the limit as s goes to zero of this expression s x of s. So let's look at some examples of how we can use this. Example one, suppose that somebody has now solved a circuit and they found that, oh, the output voltage has a Laplace transform expression of minus 4 over 2s squared plus 3s plus 1. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit of a trick so that you don't have to even worry about pulling out your calculator, but if we factor out the 2, what do we have downstairs? We have an s squared plus a 3 over 2 s plus a 1 half. And what do we want to make sure is true? When we multiply this by s, that s sometimes can cancel a pole at the origin. That's a good thing but this time it doesn't have to cancel anything. We're really interested in where are those poles located? Where are the roots of my denominator? And I can say with a lot of confidence that the poles are in the left half plane. The reason I can do that is because with a quadratic, only with a quadratic, if your linear coefficient and your constant coefficient are present and positive. And I usually go present and positive. If they're present and positive, then the roots are in the left half plane. So you could try this out, but you can factor these as much as you want as long as those two coefficients, is it clear what I'm saying? I need this coefficient and that coefficient to be present and positive, and then you don't have to do any more. You can just say those are in the left half plane. They're in the left half plane since 3 halves is greater than 0, it's present and it's positive, and 1 half is greater than 0. So that means that when we want to know the limit as t goes to infinity of little v sub 0 of t, we can simply say, well, that's the same as the limit as s goes to infinity of s times v sub 0 of x, which is what? In this case, if we look at, whoops, what am I doing? 
falling asleep, that's supposed to go to zero. So the limit as s goes to zero of s v of s is minus four times s over two times, and you don't have to keep this factored out, that two, but where's this going? Where's the numerator going? Zero. Where's the denominator? The denominator better be well behaved. It's going to one, isn't it? So that voltage is decaying to zero in the limit. And that's what we could have concluded for our capital X of S before, right? Let's do another one. Suppose we now said that we get a capital X of S of 6 S plus 1 over S times S squared plus 1.5 S plus 0 0.4. If we simply look at that quadratic, the fact that those two are present and positive says that that factor, that quadratic is stable or those roots of that are in the left half plane. And we need them to be in the left half plane, don't we? We can have we can tolerate one pole at the origin because that's going to get canceled when we multiply capital X of S with S in our formula, in our theorem. But we can't tolerate any more than that. So now let's find the limiting value of little x of t. And if you don't believe this, you could do the inverse Laplace transform, find x of t, and take the limit officially in the time domain. But now we're looking at the limit as s goes to 0 of s times capital X of s. This is now the limit as s goes to 0 of, are you okay if I cancel that s in the denominator with my s that I scaled capital X of s with? Meaning I now, in downstairs, I have s squared plus 1.5s plus 0 0.4. And upstairs, I have 6s plus 1. Where is this going? So now my numerator is going to 6. My denominator is going to 0 0.4, right? So I have 4 tenths or I have 60 divided by 4, or I'm going to a value of 15 for a final value. What about if I gave you another example? Suppose I said, here is a transform. And I want you to apply the final value theorem to that. Where is this guy located? It's in the right half plane, isn't it? So if you took the inverse Laplace transform of that capital Y of S, what would you get for Y of T? And where's that going? Is that going to a final value? No, that's burning up, isn't it? That's exploding. So now if you blindly applied your final value theorem without checking that pole, you would get an answer that's incorrect. If one... So basically, you don't apply the final value theorem. You say the limit doesn't exist. Final value theorem cannot be applied. This y of t does not have a final value. End of story. But if one would have applied
the final value theorem, then you would have blindly just said, oh, the limit as t goes to infinity of y of t, which is not equal to the limit as s goes to zero, but we're not assuming that you knew that. This is now the limit as s goes to zero of s over s minus one, zero. Oh, yeah, things are fine. Go ahead, build it. No, don't be doing that. Don't tell them that you took 320 from me. Because you have a pole in the right half plane. You can't even apply the final value theorem. One more, I know we're out of time, but this is so fun. What if I gave you z of s equaling 2 over s squared plus 4? And I said, what's the final value theorem? Or what's the final value of little z of t? Where are the roots of this guy? First off, do you have a linear term? Is it present and positive? No. Bells and whistles go off. Bells and whistles go off. Where are the roots of this? Right on the imaginary axis. So this is just going to sit there and shake, isn't it? At what frequency? Can you tell? Not from me, but from that. Two, right? Two radians per second. That's how this, this would be an oscillator. If it's oscillating always at two, what's its final value? It doesn't have a final value, does it? As you march off to infinity, it just keeps shaking. It never s stops. It's indeterminate. You can't apply the final value theorem. We'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs>